Hello and welcome. My name is John August. And my name is Craig Mason. And this is episode 452 of Script Notes, a podcast about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters. Today on the program, it's a deep dive into The Empire Strikes Back, looking back at how this 1980s sequel to Star Wars works on a script level and a story level. To help us do that, we are joined again by screenwriter Larry Kazin, who not only wrote Empire and other Star Wars films, but also Raiders of the Lost Ark, Body Heat, The Bodyguard, Big Chill, and so many more movies, it's just exhausting. Welcome back, Lawrence Kasdan. Thank you, glad to be back, I love this podcast. We, um, uh, we've arranged things so that you can see into everybody's room. You requested yeah, I, that you I, could see into people's rooms. I did, Take a good look. Is, some of them have stymied me there with their glossies. Yeah, yeah, I know a few of these people have headshots up, perhaps hoping to be the next <laughs> Indiana Jones or something. So um, we are doing this live on Zoom. We love to do live shows for the Writers Guild Foundation. This is a live show for the Writers Guild Foundation, but instead of being in a big theater with a bunch of people around us, we are staring into the living rooms and bedrooms and other rooms of people here on Zoom. Uh, thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation for putting this together. Thank you everyone who came. We have uh, 200 and some people uh, in this Zoom room watching us live. On the way to 500, I believe. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Now. Larry, we've had you on the show before. Um, you were a guest on episode 247. That was way back in 2016, a different lifetime. Uh, we were talking about Raiders. We were talking about the Star Wars movies that you were working on. Um, today on this program, we want to do a deep dive where we really focus in on one project and really the story and script behind that project. We've done this for The Little Mermaid. We did this for Raiders. Um, and being the 40th anniversary of Star War, of Empire Strikes Back, really want to talk about the process of getting from, you know, okay, we're doing a sequel to Star Wars to the movie that we saw. And to do that, we have you, but we also have your handwritten pages uh, from that script beforehand. So at some points during this video, I'm gonna be showing you some of those pages and we're gonna talk through scenes that look like the final scenes in this, the movie and scenes that are very, very different. So I'm excited to get into this. Um, this is my cue to tell people in the audience that if you have a question for me and Craig and especially for Lawrence Kasdan, use the chat function on Zoom. And if you are a premium member of Script Notes, you're gonna hear some of the audience questions in the bonus segment. Yeah, and you know, um, while we're doing this, it's not uh, a hard and fast rule, but if you don't mind turning your cameras off, it'll be a little easier for us. It's a, just because there's a billion of you and I can see all of your faces. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right and, in, and mostly right I just- Craig's I, soul. I mean, I want to, I just want to concentrate on Larry, but I have such a small, Nat like attention span, so I just keep staring at all of you. So yeah, go ahead and turn your cameras off if you can, um, or just be less interesting, that, and yes. and and we will proceed. And but we we will if we're gonna do your question, I'm sure we'll get you back on camera for that. That sounds or, great. Or maybe good one, I don't know. Lawrence Kasdan, talk us through how you became involved with the Empire Strikes Back. So Star Wars was of course a phenomenon, um, but when was your first involvement with Empire? Yeah, I um, had just written Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is um, and it taken me about six months. And I took the script up to George, handed over to him in a very ceremonial way. And he said, let's go out to lunch. And he said, um, I'm in real trouble on the next Star Wars. Would you write it? And I said, uh, don't you want to read Raiders first? <laughs> he said, I'm going to read it tonight. If I don't like it, I'll take back this off. <laughs> <laughs> but he did like it, and um, almost immediately, I, I had to have a little break, but a few weeks later, we started this and wrote Empire very quickly. And part of the reason that he was talking to you is because the first writer on Empire, Lee Brackett, was pretty sick and, and did end up passing away. So you guys, even though you're co-credited, you don't really overlap in the creation no, of Empire. And I, I wish I had met her because she's a legendary writer, both science fiction and screenwriting and written great Westerns, which I love. And she's uh, got a credit on The Big Sleep, one of my favorite movies. So she was a giant, and um, but I never met her because she was hired to do it and she became very sick. She yeah. handed in a draft, which I maybe saw once, And um, but when George made this proposition to me at lunch, she had already passed away. Yeah. She, he said, there's a, you know, there, thousand people working in England and we have no script. I mean, when, when we hear someone say, 
or imagine ourselves on the receiving end of, hey, do you want to write Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's already nerve wracking, but Raiders of the Lost Ark wasn't a thing when you wrote yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. But Star Wars was the thing of all things. Yes. Did you, did you feel anxious? Were you terrified or were you like me? You know, I was a little bit tired from finishing Raiders. Mm -hmm. I was worried about their reaction. And, um, but, um, so I was in a kind of a haze. And when he said, you know, will you come on and help me with Empire? You can't really be shocked. At that point, I've been trying to get into the business so long and had seen enough things. You know that once you get hired, then things yeah. start to work. It's, right. you know, it's murder to get hired. And no one wants to hire someone they never heard of. But the second they have a decent credit, everybody wants to hire you, even though they don't know if you're good or bad. Yes. That, yeah. So I sort of wasn't surprised that he's in trouble. He knows I just delivered a script. Maybe, right. Maybe you're the guy. So we got to read through the transcript of Raiders. And so the conversations you were having with Lucas and Spielberg about that the intentions going into Raiders, was there an equivalent session with you and George Lucas and other folks involved about what the goals were going to be going into Empire, the, the sequel to the, the surprise hit movie Star Wars? What were those initial conversations about in terms of intention and hopes and things you wanted to see this movie do? Yeah. Well, um, I, uh, my first real conversation was private with George. Mm -hmm. And when I had had my little break and I came back up to the ranch, and um, we were talking alone. And he said, you know, um, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Right. And I said, no shit. I thought that was just <laughs> fantastic. And it was clear to me that that meant the second movie was going to be very different from the first. Mm -hmm. And you must know that I love the first one. I love A New Hope. I think it's one of the great movies. And it changed the world. But... Um, Part of its fun and why it was irresistible to people is that it was so light and fast. And you know, he never stops for a second to talk about character or to have very much intimate scenes. There are a couple of things. If you get three lines between two characters, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. But everything around it is perfect. And he I learned over the years with George, you know, that that's his greatest desire to have it move fast and entertain people and anything else is gravy as far as he's concerned. Well, that was not my point of view on writing. That's not the things I had been writing. And I could tell when he told me about Darth and Luke that that opened up a whole different kind of movie than the first one. So uh, without taking anything away from the first one, which to me is the greatest Star Wars movie, um, this was gonna be a different animal. And he seemed to be receptive to that. And, you know, for the next year or whatever it was that as they went into production and I was around sometimes, it was clear that there was always a slight frisson, you know, a tension between my desire to have the characters be a little more, have a little more depth, that let the love scenes play a little bit, mm -hmm. let uh, the philo Yoda's philosophy be heard. And the always George's instinct to go faster, faster, faster. And uh, looking at the movie now, I think it, it really combines those things pretty well. And um, it, I'm amazed by how much action there is in it yeah. and uh, how well it works. And I'm amazed that it, there is a chance to know these uh, characters and the actors embraced that idea, of course, that now yeah. they had something more to play. There's a moment, um early on in the film that I think hearing you talk, it embodies that for me. It's a fascinating combination of, let's call it George and Larry. Um, there's a classic um, Campbellian story, story trope of the call to action. And we all know that George was kind of a student of Joseph Campbell. And, and so early on in Empire Strikes Back, there's a call to action uh, Obi-Wan appears like a vision to Luke and says, you're going to go to Dagobah and meet up with Yoda and become a Jedi Knight. Classic. And it's, uh, it's such a fascinating kind of your mentor reappearing and giving you this interesting challenge. At the same time, he's freezing to death. <laughs> he's just escaped from this monster that beat him up and he's going to die. And I remember even as a kid feeling like, 
this is what movies do better than anything is they give you two stories at once and it makes sense on top of each other. I remember just almost laughing at the yeah. thought that that ghost ghost Obi-Wan didn't give a damn, which meant he was going to be okay. Yeah, no, and he's going to be a, okay, which, you know, yeah. is a fault that, <clears throat> a trap that people can fall into, which is if you let out the pressure that maybe this character isn't going to live, you know, but as soon as Ben tells him what his next chapter is going to be, you know that he'll be okay. Now you pretty much knew that anyway, this sure. Luke Skywalker, oh, and you know man. that Han Solo is already looking for him. Right. So you, you think he'll be pretty good. But it's an actual release of pressure, like in a steam pipe. Yeah. Now, talk us through this early part of the process. You're having these conversations with with George. Was there an outline document? Like, at what point were things being written down in terms of your marching orders? Or like, this is what you're going to try to write. Yeah, I, I don't remember in detail, but I know that George, he was, he was under such pressure, and Lee had passed away. And he got something down, you know, that's, that's a great habit to have, you know, get something down so you can talk about it. And George was a great one for doing that. So I'm sure that we worked somewhat from his notes. Mm-hmm. And then very quickly, um, Irvin Kirshner became involved, the director. And he was an enormous influence on everything because he was such an unusual, eccentric character. He had actually taught George at SC briefly. He had made New York gritty human adult dramas before that. And when his name was announced to do the second Star Wars, people were amazed and yeah. they couldn't understand it. But um, Irvin was the kind of guy he would come in and just embrace. He's, there's a lot of his qualities in all of us, I think, in Yoda. And that if you're going to do something, just do it. And it didn't matter that he'd made the eyes of Lara Mars or Loving or whatever. Mm-hmm. He was going to do this now. And it right. was a big change for him, a big break for him in a way, because it was a big, expensive movie he'd never made. Well, there's something that's happened culturally that I'm kind of fascinated by in your mindset as a writer when you come on something like that. You know you're writing the sequel to the biggest movie of all time. It's this cultural touchstone for every generation. But it's still a time where uh, a studio might say we're making a we're making another Star Wars, and everybody goes great. And they're not particularly freaked out by the fact that somebody's been chosen as a director, and this guy who's never written anything we know has been chosen as the writer. And <laughs> so there's a certain freedom, and yes. it strikes me that now uh, if there's if there's a, a property, a franchise that uh, kind of exemplifies uh, a kind of uh, total scrutiny, it's Star Wars. Um, and you've been involved in Star Wars since. I mean, you were working on, on, on uh, what is it? I lose track of the numbers uh, on eight, seven and nine. Is that what you worked on? Seven and nine. I worked on seven. Seven. Yeah. Um, and you and, see the And the then hoopla. we did the separate solo movie. And then you did the solo movie. So, so that so, was four of these that I yeah. was involved with. I mean, do you, when, you, I'm just kind of, did you, did you have any sense at the time that you were kind of working uh under uh, uh, an interesting shroud of anonymity even though the property was so uh famous and global absolutely and you know the skywalker ranch was a you know heavily secured area you when people got into skywalker ranch they were they felt grateful the same way i feel every time i drive onto a movie lot i'm a little sort of surprised that they let me in and i'm okay and they're going to tell me where to park it's a big deal because I, for years, I looked at the gates to studios and just wanted to get in there. Well, Skywalker was much more intense than that. And people did not wander around Skywalker. And we were working up there in um, Marin. And um, it was private. And I didn't write up there. I wrote in, at home in L.A. But when we have any of these meetings, we would go up to the ranch. And this group of people in Kirsch for sure, and then some other people would join, producers, Gary Kurtz occasionally. Um, but Gary was really focused in England. He is the producer and he had produced Star Wars. And, but the things were really rolling in England and so he wasn't much involved in the story. Now, how early in the process did you know that you were really gonna follow two very different threads? So that you were gonna have Luke going off with Yoda and his whole quest line and that you were gonna have Han and Leia and Lando Calrissian, how early in the process did you know 
that those two storylines will be separate for most of the movie. Well, I, I knew it immediately because that happens in the first one. You know, the, the secret and the fun of a Star Wars is that it's never one story happening alone. Right. You're always somewhere to cut to. And when you get bored with the scene, you just cut to the other storyline. <laughs> and it, it gives you enormous uh, burst of energy. Now suddenly you have, you're back to the other thing. Maybe the other thing was, if one you were on is playing itself out, you're out of ideas, you're, and now you have a whole chance to make a different movie, right, butted up against it. And there's a lot of that in Raiders, although it's mostly from Indy's point of view. But Star Wars, the first Star Wars was like that back and forth. And even when they were together, they'd get split up in the Death Star, you know, and you're just cutting back and forth. And so I knew going in, this is gonna have that same contour. All right, so we're gonna start looking at your handwritten pages and your edits along the way, but I'm really curious about the actual physical process of writing a screenplay back in, this would be 1978, 79, mm -hmm. 80. And so this is I've probably before final draft at that point. Like, what were you actually writing on? Um, were things being before typed computers. up in the before, I mean, they were, <laughs> Was this done on a computer? Was this done on something else? Like, what was the actual no, writing no. in that time? I, you know, I, I had always been a terrible typist. And that's what some people here won't even know what a manual typewriter is or an electric typewriter, but I never mastered it. And so I was always making corrections with whiteout. It was a nightmare for me because I was never a good typist. And so I hand wrote everything I did up until Grand Canyon. My wife and I did Grand Canyon. That's when word processing really came in around 1990. And I was thrilled because now when you made mistakes, it was very easy to correct them. And I changed everything. But for every movie I did before that, someone I was dependent on a typist who yeah. was the middle person between my handwriting, which you're about to see, which is not good handwriting. <laughs> but I have everything, all those movies in handwritten pencil on long legal sheets. And it's sometimes amazing to me how few changes I made. Yeah. You know, and I th I do think that it gets to the heart of something that's very important to me, which is. Um, there's a completely different feeling about writing longhand than there is working on a computer. And you're very careful. You don't want to go back and rewrite that whole paragraph. You can mark out some stuff, but basically you're thinking about every sentence and every word very carefully, more like a novelist. Yeah. Yeah. And then you move on. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, I'm left-handed, but it's a terrible thing to be when you're a handwriter. Yeah. And my hand would be cramped and I could not even move it. But every, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Empire Strikes Back, Big Chill, they all exist handwritten in pencil on long legal pads. Well, it's the, the difference in an in a analogous way to the, the way we used to edit on old movieolas yes. where you cut the film and you splice the film together. And that's mm -hmm. obviously with the advent of nonlinear editing, that goes away. And there is no such thing as a semi-permanent cut. No, Nor right. is there any more tolerance for the little glitchy bits that used to be fairly common in the way that things used to be edited together. And the impact on the art itself, whatever you're doing, is enormous. Yeah. And I, you know, I often think, oh, I, I would like to work that way again, you know, <laughs> because not being able to change everything immediately, not being able to lift out paragraphs and sentences and move them around is completely different. So you're yeah. committing emotionally and um, in your story to that thing it took you so long to handwrite. And as you go through the process and people say, well, we want this to be different and different, then their typists have come in and it's not quite as imposing. Yeah, well, thank God you had Gail. I I'm was so looking honest. through these pages and I was like, who's, is Gail? Was she like one of the producers that I didn't know about? Cause you're like, Gail. And it seemed like you were talking to her like, Gail, forget this stuff. This is no good. I, I, I'm so sorry I wrote that. This is what matters. <laughs> it turns out Gail is the typist. Yeah, so, and I was a, I've been a hand writer of scenes for a very long time. And so generally first drafts I would write by hand, going back to go and, and early things. And so uh, Ross and Thurber and Dana Fox, they were typing up all my pages. And I did it not because I, I could type really well, but I did really like the fact that I was committing to a thing and that I, could, I wasn't going back and editing stuff I was writing the next scene and writing the next scene. One of the things that I often notice as I'm 
you know, if I start writing on the computer is I will just keep rewriting those early pages again and again and again, and won't move on. And yeah. handwriting is a way to break yourself of that habit. It really breaks. You don't want to go that back. You don't want to go through that physical thing again. Mm -hmm. And we, when people cavalierly say, well, just change all that. It's a much bigger thing. And you're thinking about you going back to the pencil. And it's same thing as Craig said, in editing, the way pe movies are edited is completely changed by the way we now edit. No question. So let's take a look at this draft. And so, um, so if you're fun. watching this live, you're gonna see this on your screen, we're gonna take it over. If you are listening to this episode after the fact, uh, we'll have the slides as a link so you can see what it is that we are talking about um, with this. But this is an early draft and you could tell us when you think um, we started seeing when we would have started seeing this. So everyone on their screen should see, we're gonna start with scene eight. And this is, uh, this is your left-handed in pencil writing version <laughs> yes. of, of, uh, of The Empire Strikes Back. Yes. So what are we seeing here? So this is- uh, And this was very early on in the process. It's at the beginning of the movie, the during the hot section, which is like the first act of the movie. And I did everything. I always, when I was handwriting all my originals and everything, I always did it in sequence. It's not mm -hmm. necessary to do it that way, but I always did. I wanted to know what was behind me. I never wanted to jump ahead. So I wrote Empire in sequence as I had done everything else. And so this is very early in the process. And because I was writing so fast, this is, you know, a few days in and mm -hmm. we were in the Hoth, uh, you know, in the corridors and which is, incredible set that I was lucky enough to visit. I had barely been on a movie set before. And then to have my first real experience be in the ice corridors of hot, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> so Craig, should we take a, a read through this for our listeners at home? And I, I love to hear sort of both the scene description and this dialogue, which is so iconic. So this is a long scene between uh, Leah and Han, um, really establishing what the beginning of what their arc is going to be over the course of this movie. So scene eight, interior ice corridor. Han strides down a corridor covered from the ice. Leah falls quickly, agitated. Behind them, unnoticed, the arm of a wampa, ice monster, suddenly detaches from a seemingly solid section of the wall. Leah says, so do you want to be Leah or Han? Craig, you choose. Oh, I want to be Leah, obviously. <laughs> Captain Sol. Han steps in from the side corridor. Um, and I can't even read the next word. Uh, going towards Leah. Turns to face Leah. Turns to face Leah. Thank you. Captain so Han, why are you leaving us now? That bounty hunter uh, we ran into on, on Bontel reminded me of what's, what I've got to do. Does Luke know? He'll know when he gets back. Don't give me that look, sweetheart. Every day, every day more bounty hunters are... Help me with the word. Searching, searching. for me. Searching for me. <laughs> Is this how it went on the day? <laughs> if I don't pay off Java, Gale. <laughs> if I don't pay off Java soon, ah, Java, uh, there'll be too many. Uh, there'll be too Maybe many to stop. stop. Uh, remotes, help me out there. Gank killers and who oh, knows gang what killers. Else. Now, gang, just no. a, as a to pause for a second. Um, did we ever hear about the gang killers? I don't think we heard about the gang killers in the movie. You know, I'm the worst person to ask. Yeah. And this has come up many times over the years because when you do gatherings or you're promoting the movie or your Comic-Con, people ask you questions. They're very detailed. They've devoted their life to knowing these details. Right. And I've forgotten that I've gone on to other things. So I'm a terrible reference. Pablo Hidalgo, who is the head of the history the of Lucasfilm, yeah. he knows everything. I feel like gang killers didn't make it. Yeah. And, and who knows what else? I've got to get that price off my head while I still have a head. Okay. So he's setting up the danger for Han. Important in this movie, but especially important for future movies. Leah says. Han, I need you here. The rebellion needs you. Oh, so it's the rebellion. Yes. Not you? Me. <laughs> my little princess. I'm afraid you don't know yourself very well. What do you mean? When I met you, I thought you were not only beautiful, but brave. Now I see you're only beautiful. I fear nothing in this galaxy. You're afraid of your own feelings. And what are they? Please tell. And the parenthetical here is flip. So just like- you know, I thought I nailed that. <laughs> I thought you did too, but I want to make sure for the folks who are, I can't read this. You want me to stay because you care for me. 
I respect you, of course. You're a bold fighter, maybe not the brightest. No, your highness. Those aren't the feelings I'm talking about. Leah looks at him. She knows exactly what he means, but pretends to understand, pretends to, uh, pretends to understand only now. She laughs. You're imagining things. Han steps closer and Leah instinctively steps back. <laughs> on, She's stop almost against the wall. Whoever, if anyone had ever been inspired to write slash fiction about you and me, this that, is this it, is what it is. It's this happening is it. now. This is the John Craig slash fiction people have been craving hot. for 450 episodes. This is hot. And Keep I, going. And I cannot even begin to describe what a terrible job I'm doing of, uh, of, of, of this dialogue. Fine. You seem fine. All right. When we did our last one and what uh, script notes and what you guys have probably done more than anyone in the world, you created a library of reference about screenwriting that never existed before. And it's more mm -hmm. voluminous than any book you could get or anything. It's wonderful resource for people. And what I'm interested in talking about whenever you want to and whenever you can is the writing itself. And this scene that we're in the middle of in the corridor is a perfect example. It's in the movie, as you say, it sets up a lot of things. In fact, nothing really changes, which is her denying his feeling, her feelings toward him, his being very cocky but uncertain. And that plays throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what, interest me is there's always two, three, four things happening at once. Yeah. Right. So that when he starts toying with her about your feelings, she denies it and she, but it's clear from Carrie Fisher and from Harrison that she's very much in love with it. She's very drawn to him and all her denials are baloney. She's playing a role as a princess. But there's that also- That kind of stuff is so rich, you know, if. The audience doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be explained to them at all. Right. They just yeah. know, they look at human faces and they say, he's not telling her the whole truth. She's not telling him. Correct. And, and it sets up a pattern that um, it's because a, a great scene uh, and, and, you know, I'm obsessed with relationships is really, we talk about character and I'm always thinking really what we mean is relationships because that's the only way character makes any sense. And that scene as delightful as it is that kind of meeting uh, these two people recontextualizing their relationship sets up a pattern that then influences and, and, and enhances every scene to follow between them because they will repeat this pattern over and over until he kind of gets it right. <laughs> You know, and yeah. which is wonderful. And she's softening every time too. Yes. It, it works on her. And just like you know. with Luke in the snow and, and dying and, and Obi-Wan showing up and saying, while you're dying, I have exposition for you. They're gonna have this in the belly of a creature that they thought was really um, an asteroid while they're hiding from the TIE fighters. So these layers of things uh, make everything better. Um, and you know, one thing I was reminded of looking at the movie is there are two scenes about he's going to split off mm -hmm. and leave the rebellion and she can't rely on him. And what is, what kind of man is he? And what happens is they get into the Falcon and they're together for the rest of the movie. Right. Right. So all this splitting up turns out to be irrelevant. That's a, that's another uh, kind of writing question I had for you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a moment um, that you know about as the writer that nobody else knows about. And sometimes those are um, kind of the juiciest moments. You know that in Hoth, uh, shortly before they get wind that the, uh, the Empire is about to attack, that Luke and Leah are gonna have the last discussion they're gonna have until the end of the movie. <laughs> they're not going to see each other again. And you know that. And sometimes I think writers don't take enough advantage of the secrets they know that the audience doesn't know because there are things going on in there that just make it all so much more interesting yes. because you're aware of that. Yes, and uh, that to me is a good part of the fun of screenwriting Yeah, because that's always happening. If, you want, if it isn't happening, then the scene is probably flat. The scene is probably too simple. It's right. always, a, and the audience, which is so fast, it doesn't need anything explained really. They get it from one look from an actor. And a lot of stuff is totally redundant when you say it. So they know, oh, there's, these are people and they have mixed feelings about each other. And maybe he knows something she doesn't know. And it's so, that's what gives it all the juice. Yeah. Well, going back to the scene with Han and Leia that we were just reading through, um, you talk about in the first movie, 
Lucas was so obsessed with speed and just getting through stuff. This scene actually has more banter than probably any scene in the first movie does and more sort of romantic comedy kind of banter. Yes. And yet, while we could see some of that stuff with a look, you also need those characters to be in a space yes. and actually enjoying it. And, and you need to see them playing the sport because we didn't yes. actually see them hitting and back you know, and forth. In yeah. A New Hope, in A New Hope, it starts, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. yep. because it was moving so fast and because it was a certain kind of idea of what a movie should be, it never pauses to let that play. So they get two strokes and they're out. So, and yep. they're wonderful strokes and they're, people quote those lines for 45 years now. And they're wonderful, but they, you really want a little more. What happens after she has that quick comeback? Right. So and let's talk about the relationship between Han and Leia and also between Luke and Leia, because coming off of the first movie, we could anticipate that this was going to be a love triangle. And it seems like that was maybe the initial conception of it, but in your movie, it's, it's not that. So at what point was there a conversation about sort of what Luke and Leia's relationship is going to be? At what point did uh, you know what that was going to be like? You know, there's a gray area, a mystery area, whenever you talk to George, because to hear him tell it, and I think it's true, he always thought this would be a trilogy, mm -hmm. that there was more to the story. On the other hand, if Star Wars had failed, there would have been no trilogy. So he wanted to just stand alone. No one really believed there was going to be a sequel to it. When it mm -hmm. was coming out, no one had any idea what it was going to be. So, but once this enormous success happened, it changed everything in George's life, not only his acquisition of the land and ILM and so on, but it also changed his attitude about what the first one was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he can find, you know, the seeds of everything in the first one. And they're there because that was his instinct. That was the story he wanted, but they're not the details. And I honestly believe that he didn't know about um, Leia and Luke. Yeah, when he was starting this. It doesn't see. It doesn't seem like it, but that's okay. I mean, yeah, it's the, one of the benefits that it seems to me you had from a writing point of view, and I'd love to hear your feelings about this. Is that because a new hope was so compressed in its characterizations and sentiment and relationships that unlike a lot of sequels where you are trying to squeeze a little bit more blood out of something that was plenty bloody to begin with and isn't so much anymore you got to kind of create the real relationships. Um, like I've often said, like one of the reasons that my wife ultimately married me and is because- I've, I've wondered so much. Yeah, <laughs> so here it is. <laughs> but she, I mean, one of the, she is a huge Empire Strikes Back fan. And in particular, when Han Solo says to Leia, I think you like me because I'm a scoundrel. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I, was, I was her scoundrel. <laughs> She, and she liked, and there was something about where in, in New Hope, and, and again, an amazing movie, there's no space for that stuff at all. Mm -hmm. It's just sarcasm and fly boy and let's get out of here. So you, yes. had an, in, you had kind of a unique opportunity with the sequel that I don't uh, think many people ever get. No, absolutely. And that applies to everything in Empire because walking into that room with George and hearing about Vader and you say, oh, this is going to give us room to do anything we want. And these characters who were so amusing and charming and fast in the first one, now I see, well, who are they? And right. that, that was a great invitation. And the same thing applied to the story because his resources were so much greater now. Every effect didn't take forever. You know, it was, there were millions of people working on it when there hadn't been before. So everything got had, more complicated. You had this writing challenge of writing for a puppet. Um, and we need I don't to get know, into Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. We have to talk about Yoda because of all the stuff that, and I don't know if we're able to show. Yeah. We, we, we think we have a lot of fix. So we're going to, oh, we might have I, a if fix. We think we have a lot okay. of fix without people being able to hijack us. We're going to try it. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow. We'll try Let's it. See. If they do, I'll, I'll freak out again. Um, yeah. But of all the stuff that's handwritten and in this, it seems to me that the Yoda stuff is probably the closest to one to one. So much of it is there. And it's kind of goosebumpy to see. And maybe because Yoda was voiced by Frank Oz, but not an actor, a human being on this, that the dialogue kind of just carried through more uh, linearly from your left hand <laughs> to the screen. But it's a remarkable challenge to write for this. It's not just a new character. It doesn't really, it's not a person that you can even imagine. No, no, and I, that was when George told me there would be a character who played that role in the story. 
and he didn't know what it would look like yet, and he wasn't sure about what it knew and how, what it could do. Every, I was excited, very excited. And he said, this is someone we've never seen. We didn't see in the first one. And I need for him to talk in a new way. I need to have be very distinctive how he talks. But more importantly, and this, both George and I love Akira Kurosawa. The Kurosawa movies, which are the greatest movies in the world, and my, he's my favorite director, they have full of characters like this. In fact, the first Star Wars, A New Hope, is practically a mirror of Hidden Fortress. You know, there's two little droids, except they're human beings and so on. Right. But all through the Kurosawa universe, there is a mentor character, mm -hmm. and there is a, the son character. There is the innocent and the experienced and the wise and the, un, you know, and the naive. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking about Yoda, it was clear that this is a guy that's in Seven Samurai, my favorite character in Seven Samurai, which is Shimada, the leader of the samurai. And he always has a different reaction to what happens in the scene than everybody else in the scene. He always sees the big picture and he's slower to react because he's figured it out. And the, the great, the brilliant thing, and this is good for any writer, is our introduction to him is a beautiful um, ballet-like incident of violence. You know, but it's approached so calmly and he calmly cuts his um, samurai knot off and it, it takes a long time. And then it bursts into action, it's over in seconds. And so you know, before he starts being the wise, patient one, he is also this incredible samurai and physically awesome. Kirshner was such a different person than George. And that created this wonderful friction between them. And if you look at Kirshner's movies, you'll see a lot more run up to the joke, you know, the run up to the gag, run up to the uh, action. Mm -hmm. He takes his time. And George likes to just go, go, go. And he's seated it correctly, but it, it makes all the difference in the world when you look at a movie, how quickly you, you get to the quick of it. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, Yoda is a great example of Star Wars kind of taking its time. Yes. yes. And so we, we, we have here the, and so this is a combination of typed and handwritten, which is wonderful. Um, so do you want to, how do you want me to do a little read through this? Yeah, John, let's do a read through. This is an important scene. So um, this is interior creature house. So he's, you called him creature. This is a, a question that we get all the time. Like when the character is becomes, you know, revealed, their identity is revealed. What do you call them at first? Well, Yoda's name was Creature. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Interior Creature House. The inside of the house is very plain but cozy. Everything is in the same scale as the creature. The only thing out of place in the miniature room is Luke, who is cramped by the four-foot ceiling. He sits cross-legged on the floor of the living room. The creature is in an adjoining area, which serves as the kitchen, cooking up some incredible meal. The stove is a steaming hodgepodge of pots and pans. The wizened little creature scurries about chopping this, shredding that, and showering everything with exotic herbs and spices. He rushes back and forth, putting platters on the table in front of Luke. Good this will taste. Wait and see, wait and see. Luke looks around rather amused by his surroundings. Well, it smells good anyway. Why you wish to become a Jedi Knight? Because of my father, I guess. And the creature gives Luke a questioning look. My father was a Jedi. Yes, yes, but why it wish you? Uh, I know it was meant to be. Creature seems uh, irritated, defensive. I feel it, that's all. Think you Yoda will be satisfied with that? Yes, I think so. Yoda will understand. Where is he anyway? Very near. When will I see him? When you allow yourself to see. The creature places a plate of steaming food in front of Luke. The young warrior studies the creature a long time through the steam, thinking, suddenly he understands. You, you're Yoda? That is my name. Why are you, why so surprised are you? So let's pause for a second. Yeah, this is not how it works in the movie. And we were talking about this before. And so Larry, I wanna, like, this is one of these areas where the, the movie did a much sort of compressed, faster reveal of Yoda as Yoda. We hear Ben's voice, Luke hears Ben talking. He, then he realizes, oh, wait a second, you're Yoda. But this was a different conception. And talk us through why this is a preferred way of doing it for, for you. For me. Yes. Yeah. 
Because the mood and the pace that all the Yoda stuff has up to this point, when he first encounters him out in the swamp, when he's making the dinner, it's all about this, which dovetails perfectly with Yoda's character, which is you do one thing at a time and you take your time and you don't rush anything. And it's quiet. It's very quiet. And then this is after you've seen, you know, a third of the movie already, practically. Right. And it's been bang, 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 and fast, 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 and monsters and rocket ships. And here is this quiet place. In fact, even up to the point where Luke splits off from Han and Leia uh, at Hoth, it's different mm -hmm. from that moment on. And for Luke, for Luke's story, yeah. theirs continues very much in the same tone. <laughs> Talk to at me the about same it. time, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was going to say at the same time, in, inside of this, you are, like the scene in the movie, contrasting what, the essential problem Luke has, which is impatience, which mm -hmm. is immaturity, which is therefore connected to fear, which leads to hate, which leads yes. to dark. It's all there in that him yes. being a yes. young man who... And just, in fact, uh, even with this beginning that you're talking about that never made it to the movie, yeah. um, that is where it goes very quickly. It goes to a discussion about his patience. It's Yoda interrogating Ben in the, you know, in the after. And uh, why does he believe in this guy? Well, he seems so impatient. He seems so young. He seems so callow. And Ben is defending him. And so that's always for writing again. This is a good rule, which is when two other characters are talking about someone, it reveals all three of them. Right, right. That's a great way of putting so, it. So, Larry, tell me about the choice of how Yoda speaks, because it's so distinctive. We're so familiar with that now, but you had to come up with that. And so what was the process of, of getting his verbs inverted, like, and what his yeah. voice was going to be like? Yeah, I think it was what I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it immediately got a positive response from George, mm -hmm. and we never turned back. And okay. um, I don't know why, it just turned, you know, it, yeah, part of it has to do, you know, with it's sort of Shakespearean, you know, and that you never, you don't start with the subject and go on to, you know, it, there's that, it slows things down. You have to worry through the sentence mm -hmm. to understand. And in that way, you're paying more attention. You know, yeah. it's funny, in the, this pandemic we're in, a lot of people are trying to meditate mm -hmm. and uh, it gives them some relief in it stressful day but when you look at the introductory scenes of Yoda he might as well be a meditation teacher right what he says to Luke from the time he lands in the swamp is you're not looking at the thing itself well yeah. let's let's read that because this is one of my favorite I mean and I'm so I'm reading this from your handwriting and this is what Yoda says to become a Jedi takes the hardest work, the deepest commitment, the most serious mind. But you, Skywalker, I have watched for a long time. All your life have you looked away, to the horizon, to the sky. Never your mind on where you were, what you were doing. Adventure, I'll add that in, excitement. <laughs> a Jedi craves not these things. That's like, okay. So I just want to say, from a sort of writing is magic point of view, that's magic. Because again, your left hand put that there, and then it sort of went into the puppet. And now it's not just something that everybody knows and shares from a cultural point of view. It is, in a weird way, a fundamental part of our understanding of Zen in the West. This is, you kind of gave us Zen through Yoda. Um, talk about how, I mean, it's one thing to say like, look, Yoda is 800 years old or whatever he was and he knew these things. It's another thing to say that you were not 800 years old. Uh, and how did you know these things? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was very interested in it. My brother was very deeply involved in it. And from the second I learned some of those precepts and uh, they resonated for me because I was... A, to this day, I have a problem of do, not doing one thing at a time. I'm always splitting my decision. And so you turn away, you knock things over, you forget why you came in the room. And right. it's not just age, which Craig will say, it's you're too distracted. The pandemic is an added distraction to a world that was already incredibly distracting. Right. And so 
when you can focus and do the thing you really want to do and, and feel it and live it, it could be three seconds, but if you really live it and you pay attention to it, it changes everything. And the, I, I like that speech, but I, what, what's unusual about that speech is that it really goes to the heart of A New Hope and him looking into the distance, wanting to get away right. from the ranch right. the farm. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, so the audience knows because they knew New Hope perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what he was like. <laughs> that's him. That's, yeah. him. that's him. That's him. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, one other thing I'll mention about this scene that's sort of legendary um, is and a sign of how good of a writer you are and, uh, and a crystallization of what good writing is, is that you have this wise character who is imparting these deep lessons of wisdom. And there's this young man who now understands that this is a wise old guy who's going to help him. <laughs> And the ghost of his other mentor has appeared. These are all calming, stabilizing things. And you understand inherently that in a movie, any movie, but particularly this movie, that comforting, stabilizing, explanatory scene has to end in the most destabilizing, threatening mm -hmm. way possible, which is Luke saying, I'm not afraid. <laughs> and from <clears throat> your left hand, Yoda says, you will be. You will be. Which is terrifying. <laughs> freaking eyes going yeah <laughs> it's always terrifying and i say that to my wife all the time as well because it's fun but that to me is the essence of what it means to craft a great scene you understood that it was going to begin here with a, a young man who doesn't even know what this little thing is and it was going to end with that little thing terrifying that young man well, i think we're always looking i always struggled to look and not usually did not find but you're looking for the thing at the end of this scene that throws you into the next one, even if it's different characters. Right. You just want to be slingshotted ahead. Yes. And when he says, you will be, it opens up the promise of, oh, this movie's going to be cool. Yeah, <laughs> actually, had you left that scene earlier on a place where Luke was comfortable or at least like was excited about like the, this next step, you wouldn't have had the same energy jumping into the next scene. It would, you would have lost energy on that cut. And instead you've gained a lot of energy by ending the scene on that moment. So let's jump ahead to Luke being scared and being afraid, um, which is this final fight with Vader. And he's cocky in it. And then he's losing to Vader. And then one of the most iconic moments in cinematic history is the revelation of that um, Darth Vader is actually his father. Um, Craig, let's you and I take a look through the pages that lead up to that. Um, but I, I'm really curious, you know, you say that Lucas told you, oh, Vader is Skywalker's father. Were you always anticipating that the revelation would happen during this fight, during this moment? Did you yeah, well, with other places? You know, when he said that in the sanctity of his office at Skywalker Ranch, um, it was understood that no one was to know this for the next two years. Okay. Right. And that's not so easy on a movie. You right. know, you've seen it. What? Oh, yeah. How hard it is to keep secure yeah. anything. And this was a giant thing that the whole world suddenly would, would be interested in. You know, and so it was from that moment on, never mention it. Never right. talk about it in public. Never say, you know, in the story conferences. You did not reveal that. And when it came to shooting, there were fake pages. And then at the very last second, the to the actors right um and d a little slightly different here the way that you reveal it is frankly more subtle i guess is what i would say um, so from so your talking, left hand yeah so talking through this um the page that we're looking at uh it starts in scene 140 and there's a zero cold chamber um some familiar dialogue here some stuff has changed a little bit along the way and it looks like an addendum page it's called, it's called insert A, and it adds to the bottom of scene 146 or whatever it is. Luke's sword whistles past Vader, and the young warrior is thrown off balance, his guard down. Vader's lightsaber flashes out with deadly skill and cuts Luke's arm off at the elbow, exclamation point. Luke's forearm flies away in the wind as the boy himself almost goes over the edge. He can barely stand. He wipes the tears and blood from his eyes, but still can barely focus on his massive opponent. And then the next page... Vader says, search your feelings, my son. You will know, you'll know it to be true. Come join your father. Luke is horror-stricken, bewildered. 
So Larry, is this an example of like that's, that's it, that line and that's, that, that information is being held back from the actors until the very last moment? Yes, that's right. They did not know. And then we had, I had written another ending. I don't remember what we were dealing with all the time during production, but it was not, that was not in there. Great. And so um, this is, a, yeah. This is a, this one is thing, pretty, you know, when yeah. you were talking about it, John, it, one of the things that interests me most in life, and I try to get into screenplays, is this um, feeling of you do sense things that you are not told to you. Mm -hmm. And we all do it. And you walk into a room with someone, you get a feeling of that person. It could be good, it could be bad. It may be like, I'm getting nothing from that person. Right. And when you think about your own life and you think, why did I do that? Well, well, that's one of a million mistakes I've made. And you feel in your body, what is that thing in you? So I think that George rightly, from the start, from A New Hope, was playing on something we all know to be true, which is you don't have to say it. No one has to tell you, you have feelings about the situation. And so when Darth is working on him he's saying you know this to be true he wants right. him to admit it because he knows it is true and that sequence um i i have a a, a sense memory as a 10 year old watching that sequence and knowing early on like you say you get a sense of things even the audiences were watching something's wrong mm. this is not the usual thing we're like good it's the good guy versus the bad guy the good guy's going to shoot the bad guy and it's over. Or they're going to have that classic fist fight at the end of the movie and then one of them's going to get kicked off the, you know, the side of the thing and that's the end of that. Something's up. You can tell. And the reason you know something's up is because Darth Vader isn't acting like Darth Vader. Yeah. This is a guy who randomly just chokes out people. One of the very, yes. by the way, the other thing about you, I should <laughs> say, like, is you're funny. You are a funny writer. You are, you are a really good, strong comedy writer. And, and so things like, for instance, Vader's like the running gag of Vader choking out, you know, <laughs> these yeah. successive admirals and captains is just funny. But then we get to the end here and he's not doing it. And it's so what is it, from a writing point of view is instead of us sitting there waiting to see how the inevitable battle clues, we are now waiting to see why this relationship is not working the way we expected. And then to satisfy people with what they were not expecting and to make sense of it all retroactively is just tremendous sleight of hand. It's incredible craft. And I think sometimes people forget because they think that all it is is like, right, 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 swing, swing, hit, hit, I'm your daddy. What? It's not like that. It doesn't work like that at all. There are a billion bad versions of that scene. And it was, it was you know, it's, it's a credit to the writing that it works. Well, thanks. But in A New Hope, you know, the ultimate moment is him saying, feel the force, Luke. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get the shot down the tiny little hole in the Death Star. Right. And the entire movie is about being in touch with the force. And he meets Ben, who's very much in touch. And in his limited time, Ben tries to get this kid to be open to it. Yeah. And Luke and his father, uh, Anakin, Darth, he knows that he can track his son across the universe mm -hmm. because of feelings that he's getting. So, and that to me is metaphorical for all of our lives, you know? And you just have, a, you go into a meeting and you have that funny feeling. What, wait, this is not right. Why are we having it now? What? Oh yeah. They, they're gonna tell me something I don't like here. Mm -hmm. you know? Or you have a conversation with your family and you say, let's start again. I'm not getting this clear to you and you're reacting and we're not hearing each other, you know? Right. Right. It's all there. And that, the whole saga is about, are you in touch with the feelings that are swirling around? Well, maybe we should get in touch with some of the feelings of the folks that are watching and listening. Absolutely. That's so my I'm segue. At... I'm being segue man. You're being segue man right now. Myself. Yeah. Um, Matthew asks, the ending of Empire Strikes Back is incredible to me because it feels so satisfying, yet so many threads are left open. Can you speak to how that was constructed and what some of the challenges were in achieving that? Yeah, so well, that yeah. gets to the heart of the movie for me because I was trained in classical dramatic construction. And if you think of a three act play, which is what we worked with generally, yeah. and in the first act, you know, you get the situation, you get the characters. And then second act, everything goes to shit. 
Yeah. And uh, you want, you know, at the, ideally at the end of the second act, it looks like doom. Yeah. And how will those people ever get back together again? How will they ever forgive each other? You know, all anything like that. It always is open ended at the end of the second act. And then the third act hopefully resolves it in a way that's very satisfying. Well, Empire Strikes Back is the second act. Yeah. And it makes it, it when I realized that immediately, I thought, this is really fun because mm -hmm. we don't have to wrap everything up. We don't have to tie it all together. We want it to be chaos at the end of this movie. Right. Well, um, this ties into this next question from Hillary, who asks, do you approach writing ensemble dramas like The Big Chill and Grand Canyon differently than writing genre films like Raiders or The Empire Strikes Back? What is different, if anything, about the approach to writing for a franchise with a fantastic intergalactic story world as opposed to something that is very much feet on the ground like Big Chill or Grand Canyon? Yeah. I don't make a big distinction between them. Yeah. I, I really think the job is always the same within the reality that you're creating it doesn't have to be have our reality it doesn't but within that there has to be some sense there's a logic to the world that you're creating and that's true in the big chill and grand canyon and star wars you know it's that's just that's what you want you want the audience not to be comfortable not to be put to sleep but to say i recognize something true here right so i'm not just thrown out because the guy does something crazy you know or if he does something crazy, then it teaches me that he's crazy. <laughs> right. you know? It's intentional. It's yes. always intentional. Yes. So Federico asks, any do's and don'ts regarding the weaving of world building and story, especially when setting up a film's universe in act one. So I'm thinking about this in terms of Yoda, which we just talked about. You don't do a lot of world building about who Yoda is or what Yoda is. Like that universe never, he's just, he exists in and of himself. You're setting up his planet, but only the degree to which you need it. Yeah. Did you have other documents that are other things thought through in terms of what all this is? Or is yeah. your world building just what we see in the movie? I'm, I'm not drawn to that. And the reason I don't generally, you know, I don't like development. I don't like story conferences, you know, too much. It's a very intimate thing to me. It's got to be the principals doing it. Um, is I don't want to talk about it intellectually. Mm -hmm. I want to write it. <laughs> and I want to know in a material way what, is going to happen what are the props here where are we trying to get to within this scene from here to here what will we use to get there what will be revealed while we're doing that about the people in the scene even if they just walked into the scene right. and that's what uh, those are the movies i love it's not my movie it's every movie that trusts the audience and says you'll get it mm -hmm. just relax <laughs> and you do get it i remember watching gravity and thinking she's doing things in the capsule. I don't know what they are, but I know they're really intense and that she's running out of time. They don't ever say that. You know, it's all lights and stuff and thing. And she's working as fast as she can. And I had so admired that, the presumption that the audience will figure it out. Great. Um, let's uh, see if uh, we want to do one so more I was, question. I was going to do Jeff's question. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff asks, it's always fun to hear about discarded early ideas. What were some wild ideas you or George had early on that were never shot and were discarded? Do you remember some things that came up early in this, this process that like, well, what if we did this and you no, went away? I don't, path? I don't have that kind of memory. And <laughs> this scene that we talked about that did not get shot the way yeah. I had written it. I, it had been reprinted in the Writers Guild magazine, my handwritten pages. And when I saw it after many, you, you know, yeah. and, and I thought, oh, that's pretty good. You know, when you've come upon something you've written years and years ago, you said, yeah. that's pretty good. And I thought it was in the movie. Yeah. And then watching the movie the other night, it wasn't there. I yeah. freaked out. I said, well, this other scene is there and it's, I like mine better, you know, and they both end up the same place, but they start completely different. Right. And so memory is really tricky. And, you know, you think you remember something, but in fact, you've created a new history that you have convinced yourself is real. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that we played any part in disrupting that history. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel terrible now. Larry, one the of the reasons why perfect. One of the reasons I was really excited to talk with you about this movie, though, is that 
I think we do rewrite a history and make it seem like everything was inevitable, that it was inevitable that like off of Star Wars, you would have Empire Strikes Back, but right. it, it was the furthest thing from inevitable. It was like, it went through, you know, Lee had done a script and Lucas was tr- struggling to get a script. You were able to sort of deliver a thing that, that could be shot, but it wasn't at all obvious how you make a sequel to that movie, or even if it was a good idea to make a sequel to that movie, because sequels were not a popular thing. I mean. Empire was the reason why we have sequels to a large degree to these big franchise movies. And we, we, we come into some of these uh, you know, giant movies with the idea of like, and then we will make it into a trilogy. Like that whole thing starts with Star Wars. So it's so helpful to have you to talk through these well, initial wrote, stages. Speaking, speaking to that, I, I will say that I find that, you know, I'm a big basketball fan, sports fan. When someone wins the Super Bowl, my guy wins the Super Bowl for the sixth time, you say, well, there's something, he's the greatest there ever was because who can do that? But what you know, if you're a really big fan, every one of those seasons, if you watched every game, there was a moment when they almost lost. Yeah. No, if Mm -hmm. it wasn't a route, and somebody made a catch you couldn't believe, or someone dropped a pass that you Mm -hmm. couldn't believe. And all those things, it happens in basketball all the time, the last minute shot, the fumble, the turnover, and what looks inevitable when they're standing there hand, holding the championship trophy was not inevitable at all. And I feel that movie makers are like that too. When you put it out there, there's a sense of like, well, that's going to be it for now. I'm not going to change this. And there is kind of, you know, solidity to it. But up to that moment in the cutting room, everything's up for grabs. Mm-hmm. And there is no inevitability about it. And very often the things you thought would make it inevitable are superfluous. Yeah. And the audience doesn't need them. So see, that's, that's what good writers sound like when they talk. <laughs> he knew <laughs> that we had come to the end and proceeded to deliver a perfect summary, a wonderful anecdote with an analogy that wrapped everything up and made it perfect. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> Outrageous. You just know how to do it. You shake, shake, shake his fist. God, it's- You're it's very just, nice. I love being with you guys. We love you too. We love you too. Greatest living screenwriter, Larry Kazan. I've said it Very a million nice. times. Um, okay. let's get and I'll say it after you're gone. <laughs> yes. And some other things too. Uh, that is our show. Script Notes is produced by Megan Aral. It is edited by Matthew Chilelli, who oh, also yeah. did our outro. Thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation, and particularly our Enid and Dustin for Thank giving us here. Um, we love your outros. So Matthew's doing the one for this week, but you just send us your outro to these shows. Send them to ask at johnox.com. It's also a place where you can send longer questions. For short questions on Twitter, Craig is at CL Mason. I'm at John August. Larry Kasdan, are you on Twitter? You're not on Twitter. You should not be on Twitter. No, but, but no. John Kasdan is on Twitter. Yeah. yeah he's, follow John Kasdan. He's, yeah. he's always there. Uh, you can find the show notes for this episode and all episodes at johnaugust.com. We'll try to put up some uh, slides about what we actually, the pages that we showed. Um, you'll also find the transcripts. We get those up the week after the episode airs. And premium members can sign up at scriptnotes.net for the bonus episodes and bonus segments. Uh, Larry Kasdan and everyone, if you guys want to un, uh, put yourself on video again and wave to Larry Kasdan. Yeah, we can we, see you now. Let's look back into your now. rooms. Oh, we want to see all your rooms. Yeah, see, all look at you in gallery view. Thanks, guys. Thanks oh, for oh, look, look at everybody. how many of Bye, you there everybody. are. There's Thanks so for many. coming. Thank you very thank much you for joining. And thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks.